I'm a good fan too, but what doesn't? Addition. That's, that's, that's true, isn't it? Yeah, those aren't those are some of the names which include some fancier Latin names. <laughs> there exists a name which is fancy. And... All right, let's uh, let's continue talking about um, rules of inference and using some of these ideas of, of detachment and indirect reasoning and so on. Um, let's extend this this example from yesterday. So um, here are some statements. If you send me an email. Then I'll finish my homework. And this is a true statement. If you don't send me an email, And all three of these are true statements. I am defining them as being true. The conclusion which we'd like to draw show that this is true. I don't finish my homework. Then I'll wake up refreshed. So if you send me an email, I'll finish my homework. If you don't send me an email, I'll go to bed early. If I go to bed early, I'll wake up refreshed. Therefore, if I don't finish my homework, I'll finish and we want to show that this is true given that these three things are true. So we can define some propositions. You don't send me an email. I'll go to bed early. I go to bed early. I'll wake up refreshed. If you send me an email, I'll finish my homework. So let's call this proposition P. P is the proposition that you send me an email. Could be true, could be false. Q is the proposition that I'll finish my homework. So what is the proposition you don't send me an email? How can we write that? That's the negation of P, not P. I'll go to bed early is another proposition. We'll call that R. This is saying, if I go to bed early, R, then I'll wake up refreshed, and we can call that S. So we want to use rules of inference and somehow conclude that this is true. And this statement down here is saying, if I don't finish my homework, which is not Q, then I'll wake up refreshed. So we're trying to show that if not Q, then S. So take what you're given and write those down as logical propositions. This is saying, if P, then Q. This is saying, if not P, then R. And this is saying, if R, then S. And we're asked to show, if not Q, then S. And 
I know that I have a statement with an S over here, but it's got an R back here, and I know that I have an R here, but it's got a not P here, and I don't have anything with a not P on the right. But it might occur to me that I could change this into something with a not P by using some sort of rule of inference. Like, um, like the contrapositive. So let's see what we have here. We have if P, then Q. Why is that true? That's a premise. That's something that we've been given. We can change that into not Q, then not P. Why? That's the contrapositive. And we know if not P, then R. That's a premise. And let me number these. So this is contrapositive of 1. Can we combine this statement and this statement somehow? Right from here, we should be able to get, if not Q, then R. What rule of inference allows us to do that? Yeah, that's a chain rule or a hypothetical syllogism, which sounds more impressive to me. <laughs> so this is chain rule of 2 and 3. So I combine those, and I got, if not Q. And you can see where we're going now. We have if R, then S. And that's also a premise. And one more hit with the chain rule. If not Q, then R. If R, then S. If not Q, then S. That's the chain rule. This is a completely different chain rule than the one in calculus, right? It is. <laughs> there are many chain rules in many different disciplines. We can chain 4 and 5 together, and we get if not Q, then S. And because we only used things that we knew were true, premises, or rules of inference that we know take something true and give us something else true, and we've proven that this is true, which is what we were asked to prove. So our conclusion, if I don't finish my homework, then I'll wake up refreshed. So there's some exercises like this in the book, um, and you can make things up and play around with them and get some practice with these kinds of uh, transformations, equivalences. Yeah? Um, are there any sort of strategies that you can recommend to start looking at these? Like, I know that in this case, they all happen to be in a nice order, yeah. so that it worked out really nicely for your example, but I'm assuming they're going to be pretty well jumbled up, so that we have to... If you find one that's pretty well jumbled up, it's really just a practice thing. It's like doing groups in geometry, right? You start off and it's like, how the heck did you come up with that? <laughs> but after you do enough of them, you start to see there's like things that recur again and again. And we're not going to do a whole lot of this in the rest of the course but it's kind of underneath, it's the machinery that's at work and the proofs that we are going to do. And I'm going to spend today mostly doing proofs of other things, more concrete things. Now we won't necessarily be using language like this, but we'll be doing this kind of reasoning. Do you have a question? Okay. All right, so before we go ahead and start doing some proofs, let's talk about fallacies. 
And I mentioned these the first day when I gave you a synopsis of the course. And there's two main fallacies that we're going to encounter. Suppose we know if P, then Q. We know that that's true. And we know that Q is true. We might be tempted to conclude that if all of this is true, then P is true. But that's not true. That's a fallacy. And it's called the fallacy of affirming the conclusion. Okay, P, you're a dog. Q, you like bacon. If you're a dog, then you like bacon. And we're giving you that that's true. And we're also giving you that you like bacon. Therefore, you must be a dog. That's a fallacy. We've taken a conditional statement, a contingency, and we've said the conclusion is true. And we're assuming, therefore, that the hypothesis must be true. And that's not always the case. The example right here. You didn't like bacon without being a dog. Here's another fallacy, if P then Q, and we know that the hypothesis is false, and we conclude that the conclusion is false. And this is also a fallacy. This is the fallacy of denying the hypothesis. If you're a dog, then you like bacon, and you're not a dog, therefore you don't like bacon. That's not logically true. Just because you're not a dog, you might still like bacon. So essentially when we face one of these problems, we simplify it down to dogs and bacon. Then you're good, yeah. This is CSE, dog and bacon. <laughs> Is this the classical like approach, the dog and bacon approach? That's the one I use. Yeah, it? Usually it's lawyers and, and telling the truth, or politicians and telling the truth. But my dogs will eat my fake bacon. Mm -hmm. Like messed up. <laughs> all right, and we, we encounter this stuff all the time, right? If you belong to the NRA, then you love America. You don't belong to the NRA, so you must hate America. People believe that, right? And it's fallacy of denying the hypothesis. Don't try to use that in a bar room to get out of a fight, though. <laughs> Just run or something. Um, so, so these are, are very common. The dog bacon one makes it pretty clear what's going on. But, but they come up in all kinds of subtle ways. And they can come up in very subtle ways in mathematical situations. And, um, and it's just something to keep for keep an eye out for. And if you reduce your argument down to a fallacy, then you know that something was incorrect somewhere in the argument. All right, let's talk about proofs. So, a proof is a way of showing that something is true. Okay, we did a proof showing that if I, uh, whatever it was, if I wake up rested, I didn't do my homework or something like that. Um, so, a theorem is a 
statement that can be shown to be true. So theorems can be proven. Conjectures are statements that may or may not be true. If you can prove a conjecture, then it becomes a theorem. If you can disprove it, then it becomes a fallacy. So methods of proof. The most natural method of proof, perhaps, is a direct proof. You start with things that you know, and you argue logically, and you get to the thing that you're trying to prove. So I'm going to work with two concepts here. An integer n is even if n equals 2m, where m is also an integer. So a number is even if it's twice some integer. twice some number plus one, which means it's one more than an even. Okay, so exactly the intuitive notion we have of even and odds. So I'm going to use those definitions, but I have this mathematical form of them. And here's a theorem. If n is odd, then n squared And if we wanted to prove this, we can do it with a direct proof. And about the only place you can start is the definition of an odd number. So proof n is odd, that's the premise. We're going to suppose that n is odd, and we're going to prove that n squared is odd. That's what an if-then means. All right, if n is odd, what can we say about n? It's not even. What else can we say? It's 2k plus 1. Yeah, it's 2k plus 1. Or some k. This is the definition of odd. Well, if n equals 2k plus 1, what can we say about n squared? 2k plus 1 squared. n squared equals 2k plus 1 squared. And what's 2k plus 1 squared? We're dusting off neurons here. 4k squared plus 1 plus 1k. n squared equals 4k squared plus 4k plus 1. That's algebra. Can we show that this is odd? How? Uh, we can show it as 2 times something plus 1. That's more algebra. We just factored out a 2 from these two terms, so it's 2 times 2k squared plus 2k. Just plug terms into k and just see if they're not empty. That'll prove it for that particular case, uh, but you want to prove it for all cases. And so far, we haven't made any assumptions about a particular case. So could you just call it 2k squared plus 2k, your new k? Sure, so we could say this is equal to 2 times l plus 1, where l is 2k squared plus 2k. That's more algebra. And that's the definition of an odd number, and so n squared is odd, and that's the definition of odd. 
writing? Is it two? Which way? It's like a, an L shaped thing. That's an L. Where's the L come from? I just set L equal to this. I just made a new variable. Because this definition of an odd number, we don't really need it to be 2 times k plus 1. This says it needs to be 2 times some integer plus 1. And I used k up here, but I could have just said n equals 2 times zebra plus 1, where zebra is an integer, and that would be the same definition. So I found n integer, 2k squared plus 2k, and 2 times that integer plus 1 is n squared, so n squared is odd. Therefore, If you were really doing this precisely, sure, you would need to show that this is an integer. And you would wave your hands and say, clearly, <laughs> L is an integer. Or you'd say closure, right? This is 2 times k times k plus 2 times k, and the integers are closed under multiplication and addition. But we won't have to do that in here. And so we've shown if n is odd, all of these things must be true, including n squared is odd. So we've proven this theorem. So that's a direct proof. We started with the hypothesis, we argued, and we were able to prove the conclusion. Sometimes a direct proof doesn't jump out at you. And you need to do something a little different. So there are indirect proofs. So here's an example. If 3n plus 2 is odd, then n is odd. So if 3 times some number plus 2 is odd, then n itself must be odd. And again, we could start with the definition of odd, so we could say 3n plus 2 equals 2k plus 1. That's the definition of odd. And maybe we subtract 1, so 3n plus 1 equals 2k, that's algebra. And we're hoping to do some sort of logical reasoning so that eventually we show that n must be 2 times something plus 1. And it's not jumping out at us how to do this. And you can do it directly, but it's not particularly obvious how to do that. So if you don't see a direct way to do this, you can go about an indirect proof. So let's call this P, and let's call this Q. And we're trying to show if P, then Q. Contrapositive says this is equivalent to showing if not Q, then not P. If we can show this, we will have shown this because by our rules of inference, this is equivalent to this. So let's try to show the contrapositive. Not Q says show if n is not odd, then not p, 3n plus 2 is not odd. If we can show that, then indirectly we've shown our original theorem. Well, if n is not odd, then what is 
n. Even. So we can show if n is even, then n of 3n plus 2 is not odd, then it must be even. So if we can show this, we'll have shown this. And we're a few steps removed from our original theorem that we're trying to prove now. That's why it's an indirect proof. And we don't know that this is true, and we don't know that this is true. But if we can prove this, we'll have proven this, and we'll have proven this. And here, a direct proof will work very quickly, because if n is even, that's our premise, so n is equal to 2 times k. That's the definition of even. And then 3n plus 2 equals 3 times 2k plus 2 equals 6k plus 2. That's algebra. And this is also equal to 2 times 3k plus 1. That's a little more algebra. So 2 times m, where m is 3k plus 1. <coughs> and so 3n plus 2 is 2 times some integer, and so 3n plus 2 is even. That's the definition of even. Therefore, if n is even, then 3n plus 2 is even. What is M? M? Yeah. Uh, I just called 3K plus 1 M. Mm -hmm. Just to make it clear that this is equal to 2 times some integer. Right, it's, it's kind of a redundant step. We're just trying to convince the reader that this number is even. And so I just wanted to say it's 2 times some integer. So instead of 3k plus 1, I just called it another variable m. And m is an integer, so this is 2 times an integer. Proofs are, are partially an exercise in trying to make everything explicit so the reader doesn't have to make any leaps in their own mind. Right? Everything is spelled out. To you, it's obvious that 2 times 3k plus 1 is even, because it's twice that. But uh, non-astute reader might say, well, that doesn't look like 2 times m, so how do you know it's even? So you're trying to like spell this all out. So this shows if n is even, then 3n plus 2 is even, so we've proven this, which means we've proven this, which means we've proven this, which means we've proven it's contrapositive, which means we've proven this. Indirect, again, the thing that we finally proved was a few steps removed from what you were originally trying to prove. <coughs> what was equivalent to it? And this takes practice, sort of deciding which approach to use and figuring out which steps to use to get from one point to the next to the next. It's a practice thing. It becomes easier the more you do it. times b, then a must be less than or equal to the square root of n, or b is less than or equal to the square root of n. That 
that's a theorem. So for example, uh, A equals H, B equals 2, N equals 16, the square root of N equals 4. Well, B is less than the square root of N. A happens to be bigger than the square root, but at least one of those was less than or equal to. Or if I said A and B are both 4, N is 16, they would both be equal to the square root of N. So our theorem is still true. And in fact, this theorem is true for any non-negative real numbers, A and B. So we'd like to prove that. So any ideas how to approach a proof of this? I usually start with contradiction. I don't know if I've got a negative slant on the world or what, but somebody tells me something's true, I'm like, uh-uh, wait a minute. And I always try to find an example where it's not true. Because finding examples where it's true, that just gives you a warm fuzzy that this is true. But I tend to immediately say, what if this wasn't true? Right, and try to find a problem. So that's a proof by contradiction, an indirect proof. So let's prove this by contradiction. So I'm going to call this P, I'm going to call this Q, and I'm going to call this R. And so our theorem is saying if P, then either Q or R. And a proof of the contradiction is really just using the contrapositive. So prove if P, then Q or R. So instead, I'm going to prove if not Q or R, then not P. <coughs> and to do that, I'm going to prove, I know from De Morgan's theorem that the negation of Q or R is just not Q and not R. So all I have to do is prove this. If Q is false and R is false, then our hypothesis P must be false. So this is what I'm going to prove. So I can start off with not Q, that's a premise. And I can also start off with not R, that's a premise. So what does not Q say? What's the negation of this statement? A greater than the square root of n. Right, so A is bigger than the square root of n. And the negation of R says the same of B. B is greater than the square root of n. And we're trying to show if A is bigger than the square root of n and B is bigger than the square root of n, A times B is not equal to n. Right, not p is the proposition that n is not equal to a times b. And if a is bigger than the square root and b is bigger than the square root, what can we say about a times b? And these are all positive numbers. <coughs> It's greater than the square root of n times the square root of n. So a times b is bigger than square root n times square root n. That's algebra of inequalities for positive numbers. 
and we know the square root of n times the square root of n is equal to n, that's algebra. And so a times b must be bigger than n. That's substitution, I guess. That's just substituting n in for square root of n times square root of n. And if a times b is bigger than n, is a times b equal to n? All right, so from this we can conclude a times b is not equal to n, and that's definition of a greater than. And so therefore, if we have this premise, and we have the premise not r, then we've got the negation of p. And so we've proven this. And then if we took the contrapositive of that, we would have this. So we've proven this, we've proven this, we've proven this, which means we've proven our original statement. And once you took the contrapositive, it's fairly straightforward. But if we didn't do that, it's not clear how to take the square root of a times b and somehow say something meaningful about a or b. But the multiplication of a and b, we can say something meaningful about their product. So that's an indirect proof of this, this theorem. Another technique that's pretty powerful, proof by cases. Where you're trying to prove something about a situation, but you can break it into a series of subsets and say, well, we're in one of these five <clears throat> situations, and you can prove your theorem for each of those five situations. If you know that you were in one of those five, then you've proven that no matter what the situation is, your theorem is true. But well, what about unknown situations? If you have unknown situations, then you have to account for those. And if you can't, then you've narrowed your proof down, but you haven't completely proven it. <coughs> and that's how a lot of these really hard problems break down over time. So Fermat's last theorem, right, trying to find a solution in positive integers for this for n bigger than 2. So I mentioned this the first week also, and this was proven in the 90s after more than a century of effort. But there were a lot of cases where people knew that this was impossible. And the set of possible values for n was getting smaller and smaller. The set of characteristics that n had to have for this to be true was getting more and more restrictive. But until the 90s, nobody had a complete proof for all possible values of n bigger than 2. But you whittle it down um, by doing cases. So um, here's an example. So let's just do integers. So the maximum of two numbers x, y plus the minimum of two numbers x, y is equal to x plus y. So that's the theorem. And do you believe this theorem? Does that mean that uh, the second x, which is, is small enough that it doesn't really make an impact on the bigger x? Uh, Say that again? When you're adding the minimum of x to the maximum of x? Minimum of x and y to the maximum of x and y. Are these like vectors? No, x and y are just two numbers. Okay. So this is whatever the largest of those two numbers is. This is whatever the smallest of those two numbers is. Okay. 
So for example, x equals 3, y equals 5. So the maximum of x comma y is 5. The minimum of x comma y is 3. That's 8. That's equal to x plus y. So can we prove that in general, regardless of which integers x and y are? And so my first question is, do I believe this? Yes. So why do we believe it? Because one's smaller than the other, or if they're not, then it doesn't matter which one. Yeah, one is smaller than the other, or if they're not, it doesn't matter. So you've just named some cases, right? So one is smaller than the other. Well, there's actually two ways that can happen. So case one, x is less than y. Case 2, x is bigger than y. Case 3, x is equal to y. And we need to wave our hands and say these are the only three possibilities. So we do that. So let's look at case 1. x is less than y. What's the maximum of x and y? Right, so max of x, y will be y. What's the minimum of x, y? It's x, and x is less than y, so max plus min equals y plus x, and that's equal to x plus y. So if this is our case, we've proven this is true. And similarly, if this is our case, and I'll get a little sloppy with my notation here because the time is getting short, maximum is x, minimum is y, max plus min equals x plus y equals x plus y. And so this is true in case 2. And in case 3, x and y are the same, so the maximum is equal to x, the minimum is equal to y, and the max plus the min will be equal to x plus y. So we don't know which of these three cases we're in, but whichever case we're in, we know that this is still going to be true. So we've proven it by those three cases. When you say they're equal, and then you said max is x and then y. I could have said max was y, but it's the same as x. So what? Right. So I'm okay saying the max is x. So if max is x and min is x, though. Okay. But min is x, x is min y, is also so y. y. Yeah. yeah. So I just chose those. <laughs> is more complex than something I would expect you to come up with on a test, but it's really elegant. It was known to the Greeks. This was the thing that ruined Pythagorean day, and theorem squared of two is irrational. I think I was 10 or 11 when I was in the library and I stumbled across this and I was like, what the heck? I didn't quite understand it, but it seemed intriguing. Um, square root of 2 is irrational. Okay, we want to prove this. So let's do an indirect proof. So prove square root of 2 is, well, So square root of 2 is not expressible as a over b, or a and b are integers. So we're going to prove the opposite, prove if uh, x equals a over b, then x squared is not equal to 2. So there's no rational number whose square is 2. So I'm going to do a proof by contradiction. Assume square root of 2 equals a over b. Square both sides, 2 is equal to a squared over b squared. 2 times b squared is equal to a squared, 
a squared is even because it's two times the square of an integer. All right, we haven't proven this yet, but you can do it as an exercise. The square of an even number is even. The square of an odd number is odd. That's really straightforward to prove just using the definitions. So if a square of a number is even, A must be even. So we can write A as 2 times some other integer C. And since 2b squared is equal to a squared, two b squared is equal to four times c squared. Divide both sides by two. B squared equals two times c squared, which means b squared is even, which means b is even. So if you can write the square root of two as a over b, both of these are even, which means we can divide them by 2 and write this as a1 over b1, where those are both integers. Well, we can do the exact same thing. We can show that both of these are even, and so we can divide those by 2 and write this as a2 over b2, where those are both integers. But if we keep dividing an integer by 2, eventually it's not going to be an integer anymore. This could be 1 million over something else, but after we divide it by 2 20 times, it's not going to be an integer anymore, because you can't divide by 2 indefinitely. And at that point, this will no longer be even, and we'll have reached a contradiction. Or more succinctly, you can start off by assuming that this has got this is in lowest form. There's no common denominator. And you go through all of this and you show that 2 divides both A and B and that's your contradiction. So by assuming this, we reached something that was impossible. <clears throat> and so we know that this must be false. And the conclusion is that square root of 2 must be irrational. And I don't know how you come up with this if you've never seen it before. Because it's not obvious to me, like, why you do any of these steps. But that's proof the square root of 2 is irrational. And it's an indirect proof. But it's very rigorous mathematically. All right, so we'll spend some time next week going through some more examples. But I want you to think about these. Homework 2 is posted and involves some propositional work and some proofs, mostly odd even numbers, I think. Um, but I think the book has some other examples of things you can prove. We'll talk about a few of these on Monday. And then we're going to move on to number theory, which will be some more arguing about things like this, but also looking at prime numbers and divisors and ways to find common factors and leading us ultimately to talking about cryptography and public key systems. Cool? All right. Have a good weekend. I'll see you next class or in the lab or on Monday.